it's just good to be part of that team here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. Um, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to uh, pray in just a, a few minutes before uh, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a uh, introduction here to the message this morning. I've been kind of starting a, a new series of talks, and I've just simply called it the story, and this is now the third uh, the, the third uh, sermon on that. And just to give a brief recap, uh, in case you weren't here, it's really trying to illustrate the broader picture that we are all a part of within the within the story of redemption, within the great controversy. And I, I've, I've specifically chosen certain language and not chosen other language because I'm trying to, to, to illustrate things that we don't always think about when it comes to the story that we're part of. But some of the, the main ideas or the big picture is that we are a part of the story of redemption, that when, when sin happened in the universe, it didn't just affect humanity. As a matter of fact, sin precedes humanity. It started in heaven, and it affected it affected the universe. And God is able well, God was able to quarantine it to, to planet Earth. But we need to remember that the decisions that God makes impacts more than just us. It's not just us and God and the devil that are involved in the the story that we are part of. Sin affected the entire universe, and this is something that we don't always remind ourselves of because you know the Bible does teach that there's a judgment. And that we are part of that judgment and that we, we, we ourselves are going to be judged and God is the judge. He is the ancient of days. He is on his throne. But we sometimes forget that God himself is also being judged. And this is not as radical as we sometimes think of it. I mean, even within our American system, when judges make decisions, do we just sit back and say, oh, it's been decided. The judge has decided there's nothing we can do. It's just the way it is. That's not how it works. If we don't like what the judge decides, we protest or we vote him out of office. Recently, the Supreme Court, which they're lifetime appointed, they don't get voted out of office. When the Supreme Court recently made decisions, did everyone just say, oh, the judge has decided that's now the way it's going to be? People get very upset. And in a free moral thinking society, when God judges, he has to do so in a way that the universe itself will sit back and say, that was right. That was noble. God has done the right thing. Are, are you with me? So we need to remember that as God is doing the work of redemption and the work of judgment in our lives, he is doing it in such a way that he knows that unfallen worlds and angels and everyone else that is involved in the great controversy has to be able to walk away from that and say, that was righteous. That was good. Because if God gets it wrong, and we don't like, you know, God's perfect, right? He can't get anything wrong, except that there was a guy in heaven that said, I don't like you, God and I'm going to break away from you, and I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to take as many down with me as I can. God has got to bring resolution to the great controversy in a way that every free-thinking moral agent that has been created is able to look at that and say, that was right. That was good. Okay? That's part of the story. That's part of the recap. And so last week, I also talked about the plan that God has and how in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and there was harm. And creation was an act of His Word. By the Word of the Lord, the heavens exist, right? And, and He spoke and it stood. Uh, he does it through the cross and through the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. But he also does it through the law. The law is the word of God. And last week I talked about how the law itself came from the throne room of God when we talked about the sapphire law. And then I said last week that I'm going to be focusing on one of the commands as an illustration of what uh, the intervention of God in the great controversy and through this story means to us uh, through the giving of the law. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And um, I want to bring and put on the screen here the first command. We have all kinds of technology challenges at times. The, the smoke, all the thunder, the lightning, the trumpet blast that was there, extreme power and solemnity. Then God spoke all these solemnity. Then God spoke all these words saying, I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Now I pause here because there is a, a, a heightened level, I feel, of, of solemnity, of, 
of sacredness when we begin to enter into uh, topics like the nature of God's law. In a similar way, when we talk about the nature of Christ, Spirit of Prophecy says that when you talk about the nature of Christ, you need to remove your shoes because you are on sacred ground. Now, that's a metaphor. I'm not saying that I'm going to take my shoes off here on the stage. But it's talking about an attitude and a spirit of the heart. I'm going to take my shoes off here on the stage. But it's talking about an attitude and a spirit of the heart. And that's not to say that other topics of the scriptures and other topics of, of, the, of the story and the plan of redemption aren't important, aren't sacred. But there are certain things, just like in the temple, there was a holy place, but then there was a most holy place. I think there are certain topics that are holy, and then I think there are topics that are most holy, right? And what was in, by the way, the most holy place? Wasn't it the law? Wasn't it the law? So I pause here just for a moment, and I want to acknowledge that we are now treading upon a most holy topic. And now I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we have come here for from various places and for diverse reasons, and we come from different contexts, but no one is here by accident. You have established your plan that everyone who's here, including myself, I am a recipient and and part of this message as much as anyone here, Lord, but everyone is here for a reason. And Lord, as we join our hearts together and we continue in the spirit of worship, We dedicate this time to you. And Father, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us and that we would learn more about you, more about the story that you want us to understand, and that we would be renewed and re-energized by this time that we have with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When God created our world, The story had already begun. The great controversy had already begun. There had already been war in heaven, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. And the things that God did in the creation story was his response to sin. It was an intervention to sin, including the very first institutions that we read about in the book of Genesis, namely marriage and the Sabbath. When you think about it, when God created Adam and Eve, he was was describing and creating the sacred relationship that sin had destroyed. Sin had, re, sin had destroyed the intimacy between God and the fallen angels. And God was wanting to restore or reestablish the meaning of that intimacy when he created Adam and Eve. And even when he created the Sabbath, God was creating the context through which relationships could grow strong and be maintained that he knew created creatures, even in perfection, before Eve and Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, even in perfection, God knew that they needed to have a time, a sacred dedicated time to break away from the good work of tending the garden and growing and all the things that they do to reform and reestablish their relationship with each other and with God. God established his response to sin right from the beginning. You know, it is, a, it is a beautiful and wonderful thing to be committed to someone and to know that they are committed to you. It, it's nothing short, really, of a miracle. It's not natural to the selfishness that we are born into. To love someone, to freely choose to love someone, and to know that they in return love you to hold and embrace someone and to feel them hold and embrace you back. Timory was one month old when I graduated from college. She, she was born in May. I graduated in June. Um, that first year of her life was an extraordinarily crazy time for my wife and I. We began uh, a, a work. I was becoming a professional pastor for the very first time. I was an intern. I'd done student pastoring before that. But we were now moving. We actually moved three times, three times in, in Timory's first year of life uh, for various reasons. The conference had made some decisions and done some redistricting. My wife was still pursuing the prerequisites for her nursing degree. Um, we were just learning about a Bailey having autism, and we were kind of just getting into the world of discovering what that meant. It was an extraordinarily, and I, by the way, in my first year of pastoring, I was in five different churches. 
five different churches. Okay, And not that that's a bad thing. I made some wonderful relationships and it was busy. But the bottom line is this that I wanted to share. And I don't say this with any enthusiasm or angst. I have very few memories of Timory's first year of life. I have very few memories. It's part of the middle child syndrome. <laughs> the middle child always feels left out. But honestly, I don't remember her first step. I don't remember her first word. Now, when I'm reminded about these things, I'm like, oh, yeah, now I remember, now that you tell me about it. I don't have as many of those intimate memories of Timri than I do of my other children, and I feel terrible about it. But there is one thing I remember. I remember when she first started hugging me. I don't remember the age, five, six, seven months in that. Not just when a child is, you know, cranky and they just want to be held or, you know, they're tired and, you know, or anything like that. And they, but that first time you feel those chubby little arms pull around your neck and then squeeze. It's like at that moment, everything in the world is right. Everything in the world is good because I love someone and I'm holding them and they love me back. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to experience love and commitment. Many of us in this church have experienced that with our children or with our spouses. And sadly, many of us have also experienced the loss of that love, whether by death or divorce or other circumstances that have removed that from our circumstance. God himself has experienced that loss. We have to remember that when Satan rebelled, this was not simply a political, territorial arrangement that God had with him. This wasn't simply two nations at disagreement over property or over treasure or over influence like many of the battles, most or all of the battles on planet Earth. This was a personal Family relational destruction. Satan was a, an intimate part of God's family that decided to say, I'm no longer committed to this relationship. And everything that God has done since that time is in the context of God trying to reestablish the purpose and meaning and power of intimate love relationship. Is that okay? Are you with me on that? This is the story that we are part of. And when we come to the context, even of the Ten Commandments and what God says to us in those commandments, we have to remind ourselves of that. But I have not neglected or forgotten that I want to have a chance to hear from our young people in the church today. Toby, are you willing to be my, my main person here? And if, if someone else, um, it's, it's good because we're kind of spread out here. Look at that. I was going to look your direction, Mark, but then I knew Mark is going to get up. And uh, so I just have one question, but I'd really like to have five or six answers from young people that are here today. And uh, I would really like your help with this. What are some ways that God has shown us that he loves us? There's no wrong answer here. Just from your mind, Abel said, I know, I'm ready to go. What is something God has done? I died on the cross. He died on the cross. Absolutely. That, but he's done more than that, hasn't he? Can you think, think of your Bible stories? Think of something that gives you joy in life that you can say God has done. Uh, done. What else has God done to show that he loves you? Okay, in the back. Thank you, Mark. He gave us guarded angels. He gave us angels. He gives us protection. That's right. Very good. He sends us, he sends uh, his messengers to us. All right, Owen in the sound booth. Come on, I want to hear from a few more. Just think about it. Think what anything God has done to show us that He loves us. He created us. Ah, very good. Basics. He created us. That's a good thing. We wouldn't be here if He didn't create us. All right. Uh, I think I see Anna over here. Good to have some highsies in church today. Yes. He gave us pets. I love it. Absolutely. That jarred something in Taylor because as soon as he heard that, he's like, I'm in this. I'm, I'm right here. All right, Taylor, and then maybe one or two more. I just, 
He gave us nature. He gave us nature. Yeah, I know. That's wonderful. And then is that London in the back? London. Maybe London will have our last one. Oh, no, and Sean. More into the safety, but like the fact that we got here safely. He gives us safety. Okay. He takes care of us, cares for us. All right. And then, uh, Sean, our last one. He gave, us the Bible. he gave us the Bible. Are these good answers? These are all good answers, aren't they? Thank you, Mark, Toby. You can just put the mics on the front pew here. That'll be fine. Uh, I'll, you know, you guys mentioned most all of these. I'll just put them on the screen. Yes, he created us and he created the universe. You know, Spirit of Prophecy says on every blade of grass is written God is love I love that he gave us the Bible he gives us families he gives us the church no one said that <laughs> we are we're the bride don't you think he loves us the bride sometimes uh, the bride doesn't always stand up to what it's supposed to be he sent us the Lord and everything the Lord does the cross and and giving us salvation he's in heaven now preparing for us us. He, he gave us uh, the promise of his return. He never gives up on us. All these things show us God's love. How come nobody said the law? You know, if you were to ask the average teenager, what do your parents do to show you that they love you? How many of you think that teenager would say, oh, my parents give me a curfew. They limit my screen time. They monitor my cell phone. It's just wonderful. They make me eat my peas and carrots. Uh, I have chores that I got to do. They make sure I get my homework done. And every time they tell me, my heart wells up with love because they've given me these wonderful things. We don't normally think of rules and commands and boundaries and limitations and expectations as love. But what do you think a parent says about those rules? Why do you make your kid go to bed on time? Why do you make them eat their vegetables? Why do you make sure they get their homework done? Why don't you let them watch rated R movies? Because I love them. They need their rest. They need their vitamins. I don't want their head filled with trash. They need to be careful what they're doing online. I do it because I love them. But does the child always view it as love? Are we any different as believers when we approach God's law to us? You know, it's interesting to read passages like Psalm 119. For like 170 verses or something like that, the whole psalm is, how I love your law. You ever read that and like, I, I don't get it. I mean, that'd be like saying, oh, I love that the speed limit is 50. And I love that stop sign that makes me stop. Oh, I love it. Now, we understand it. We appreciate that it provides boundaries, that it provides a system of order and things like that. But to love, that that is an expression of love? But that is exactly what the law is. It is a gift of love from a parent putting boundaries on us because why, why do we give our kids these boundaries? It's because we know without them, they will probably not be successful. How many of you have ever had to tell your child, you eat that bowl of ice cream before you get up from the table or else you're not getting up? You don't have to make that rule. Normally, it's you only get one bowl of ice cream. You have to limit it in that way. But there are things, if they're already naturally doing them, we don't need to put those boundaries. They're already naturally doing We put the boundaries and we put the rules and we put the, 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 the areas and the, the restrictions in areas that we know without them, they may wander and find themselves playing on the freeway while traffic is coming their direction. So we tell them, you're not allowed to play in the street. But that's so much fun. It's so much open area. You know, I grew up, when I was growing up, I played in the street. That's where the best baseball could be played. We had a tiny little yard. If you wanted to play baseball, you went out in the street to play it. And then you just watched for cars. We had to be told, don't play in the street. But it's so much better. I don't want you to get hit and killed. You're so unfair. God gives us this. He, 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 he incarnates his word and his law because he loves us. So the story that we're talking about really is a love story. When God gave those tablets, those sapphire tablets, it was an expression of God trying to restore the love relationship that had been lost because of sin. 
and he's illustrating the needs and boundaries that we need to have. So it is a love story. And somebody asked, well, why didn't you call it when you started the series? Why didn't you call the love story? Well, if I'd done that a couple of weeks ago, none of the men would be here now. They would have said, oh, pastor's doing a series on love. Blah. I want to go someplace else where we're going to learn about Rambo. But when you boil it down, the real story of the Bible is an intimate story of relationship and love. And that is what the law is all about. And we cannot understand it outside that. We actually run afoul of, of the true meaning of the law when we fail to see that it is in, in the context of God trying to restore uh, love to us. In Deuteronomy, just before the Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy 5, Moses says this, Indeed, ask now concerning the former days which were before you, since the day God created man on the earth and re inquire from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything been done like this great thing? So he's talking about God saving Israel, God bringing uh, Israel out of Egypt through all the miracles, through the Red Sea, giving them the law. And he says, nothing like this has happened since creation. Ask around, you'll find that nothing has happened. Has anything been done like this great thing? Or has any, anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of fires? You've heard it and survived. Or has God tried to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials and signs and wonders, by war, a mighty hand, and an outstretched arm? Every time the Old Testament talks about God saving people through an outstretched arm, I can't help but think of the cross, right? Isn't that how Jesus saved us? Through outstretched arms on the cross. And by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God, and there is no other beside him. He is God and there is no other beside him. Out of the heavens he let you hear his voice to discipline you. And on earth he let you see his great fire. And you heard his words from the midst of the fire. Because, now this is the first time he's given a because. The whole reason God has done this. Why he spoke to you from the fire. Why he pulled you out of Egypt. Why he gave you his word. Why he's done all these wonderful things. The whole reason why he did this is because he loves you. He loved your fathers. Therefore, he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. So right after that, he repeats the Ten Commandments, and then about a dozen times after that, in the book of Deuteronomy, he reiterates over and over and over the connection between loving the Lord and the Lord loving us and keeping his commandments. I'm not going to read them all, but just a few. Deuteronomy 10, 12. No, Israel, now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord, walk in all his ways, and love him. And love him. And to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. You shall therefore love the Lord your God, and always keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinance, and commandments. Deuteronomy 30. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, that you may live. Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live in your descendants by loving the Lord your God and by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him, for this is your life and the length of your days. And the last one, this is from the blessings of Moses in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 3. It says, indeed he, God, indeed loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand and they followed in your steps and everyone receives of your words. The story of the commandments of God is a love story. It is a story not just of a father giving children boundaries, but throughout the Bible and throughout the Old Testament, God relates to his people as a bridegroom and a bride. The same intimacy and trust and commitment that is found in marriage, God desires to see with his people. Now, when you think about it, I use the illustration of children and the rules that we give them. But when you think about the marriage vows in, the, in and of themselves, right? The traditional marriage vows. Uh, will you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, having to hold uh, for better, for worse, and sickness and health, and richer and poorer, uh, forsaking all others uh, uh, until death do you part, right? That's kind of the traditional vows. By the way, I love weddings. Weddings are so much fun. Anyone wants to get married, let me know. I'll do it. I'm ready to go. Commitment. It's a beautiful thing. But you think about all those statements, the traditional ones, and people write their own vows, and that's fine. 
But all those statements are rules. You mean that I have to forsake all others? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we leave that one out? Let's leave that one out. I don't want to be bound in this relationship with just, I want to be able to date other people. What's wrong with that? Does that make much sense in a marriage? How about the death to you part? To, until death you part. You know, I'd really, that's a good sentiment, but really I'd like to try this marriage out for a few years. I don't want that death to you part bit. Um, can we just, can we just, do this as a test model, and then at the end of a few years, I'll return it if it doesn't work out quite right. How many of you would want to enter into a marriage contract with someone who says that? Or how about the, the uh, in sickness and in health? You know, I really am uncomfortable around sick people. They're kind of squeamish. I, I'm, I'm happy to be married to you, but you get sick, I'm out of here. All of those traditional statements, even within the marriage vow, are our boundaries, their commitments. I am willing to abide by these rules, these commitments. And when you're, when you're in love with someone, you don't even hear those things. You're just like, can I just say I do, please? Can we just get to the end of the thing? Because then there's the honeymoon. That's really like what I'm interested in. Right? People don't, when you love someone, when you love someone, none of those things are a burden. Forsaking all others? Are you kidding me? I can't wait. You're the only one that matters. Until death do us part, I would die without you. Of course. In, the, in sickness and when you're sick, I want to be there with you. For richer, for poor. Well, I mean, not the poor, but for richer. You know what I mean? When you love someone, those vows and those rules are easy. You don't even worry about them because you're committed, because you love them. The commandments are the vows that we make when we bring ourselves into alignment with God. The law of love, the law is an expression of God's love. It's his response to sin and Satan. It's an incarnation of God's character. We talked about that a little bit last week. And I just want to use the first command again to kind of illustrate uh, some of these ideas of, of what I'm getting at, how the law is, is best understood in the story of love or as a love story. And this is the first command. The first part of it is kind of a prologue or a preamble is how it's usually viewed. God says, I am the Lord your God. He says, I'm already, <laughs> I am, not I will be, not I was, I am Yahweh, that's the Lord. Okay, I am the Lord, and I am already your God. You want to know why? Because I brought you out of slavery. I've purchased you. I have saved you. I have redeemed you already. You are mine. I have already shown my commitment to you. That's the preamble. I have already shown my power. I've already shown my willingness and the lengths to which I will go to save you and establish you and give you purpose. I am the Lord your God. I have brought you out of the circumstances that ensnared and enslaved you. And I have given you a future. That's the preamble. I've already committed to you. Before you ever said a word, I committed to you. Now here's your chance. And the first command, which by the way in Hebrew is seven words. Seven words. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods. Now, I want you to think about something in the context of the great controversy. This, and, and for the sake of time, I have to limit myself and what, what I can share here. But it's interesting, and we need to be careful to not separate one command from the other nine or not to prioritize one command, they all, it's kind of like the Trinity. You can't, you can't overemphasize the Spirit to the detriment of the Father or the Son. You know, you have to see it as a package deal. And I, I recognize that. And, and, and yet we can also see the beauty and uniqueness if we look intently at each part of the law. But it's interesting that God begins the law with this. Because there are so many other places and ways in which God could have ordered and arranged the Ten Commandments. Really, the 10th command 
could be considered the first commandment. And you know, when you think about the paradox in the Bible, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In a way, not coveting uh, uh, could be considered uh, the equivalent book. In anyways, I, again, I don't want to get into this. But this is, in a way, the first word of God incarnated in stone as God's response to sin. This is how he begins. This is the first word. You shall have no other gods before me. I've committed to you. Will you commit to me? I want to just break this down. And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, so don't worry. But all of these things are fairly uh, fascinating to me. First, when he says you shall, the you is in the singular. When he's addressing the people, he's addressing the congregation as a whole. But when he says you, he says it in the singular. He's not saying you people as, as a group. He's not saying y'all, right? He's saying you in the singular, okay? It's not enough to be part of an organization that keeps the law. It's not enough to be part of a family that says, oh yeah, grandma and grandpa went to church and, and I have an uncle, he's a pastor, so I, I guess I'm taken care of. We're from a family that keeps the law. This is a singular invitation to be written on the heart of every individual. You, singular. You. This is between me and you. It's not just me and the people. It is between that as well. It's a both and. But it's you, singular. Are you willing to make this commitment? Individually. Personally. You. You shall. Now, it's interesting that every time in the Bible when God says, you shall, or you must, or you will, Every time God gives that commandment, he's giving it as an instrument or a vehicle of salvation. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was saying, if you follow this command, you're going to be safe. You shall not do this. He told Noah, you shall build an ark made of gopher wood and cover it with pitch. You shall do this. He gave him a command, but the command is given as a vehicle of salvation. If you do this, you will be saved. He told Abraham, you shall be a blessing and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And by Abraham having Isaac, then the Messiah is able to come through the lineage of Abraham and salvation is provided to the entire world. Every time God gives us a command, it is because he's offering us salvation. It's not because he's wanting to keep us from having fun. It's not because he's arbitrary and just sits on a throne and, and is, is capricious and says, you know what, I'm just in charge and you're not, so you better do what I say. And I, by the way, this is not a, a sermon on salvation by works either, okay? When Noah built the ark, Noah built the ark, didn't he? So could you say, well, Noah, God didn't do anything. Noah built the boat and he, he sa sailed in the boat. Noah saved himself. No. God still had to be with Noah. God still had to give Noah the energy and strength. God still had to preserve Noah in the storm, right? That'd be like saying if someone was dying of hunger, Evandro, have you ever been really hungry? If you were dying of hunger and Pastor Dave came along and said, Evandro, I want to save you. Here's a cheeseburger. You don't eat cheeseburger. Here's a, uh, here's a pasta. Is that better? Here's pasta. And you ate that pasta. And it saved your life. Would you be like, this pasta is my Lord. And say, this pasta saved me. I'm going to build an idol. to. The, I'm going to put this pasta on a pedestal. I'm going to forever worship pasta. Because pasta has saved me. Would you do that? Or would you say, thank you, Pastor Dave, for the pasta? Yes, we need to eat the pasta, but it's the person who gave us the pasta that sa saves us. Is that okay, Michael? Would that work? Okay, praise the Lord. God gives us His commands, not because we save ourselves through our own works and our righteousness, but because He's giving us a pathway that He walks with us and provides for us that by following His command in law, it saves us from ruin. So every time God says you shall, he's giving us a vehicle of salvation. You shall have no other gods. You shall have no other gods. Now in the immediate context, 
They come from the polytheistic Egyptian culture that had many gods. They're going to the Canaanite culture that had all kinds of dirty, nasty little gods. And so you could say that God was trying to save them from that, and that's fine. In the more global context, and in today's context, the gods that we are tempted by are not so much the idols of Moloch and Baal and Chemosh and Dagon and things like that. It's more things like Hollywood and sports and politics and, and, and our own hobby horses that dominate and influence our lives to a greater degree than by which we allow God to influence our lives. Those are the idols we struggle with today, right? I don't know how about you. Maybe some of you have some pictures that you worship at home and things like that. I don't know. But I think in our more modern context, it's not so much the gods of, of uh, uh, pagans and, and heathens that we struggle with as it is of our modern materialistic world that seeks to dominate our life. But in the universal context, you shall have no other gods was because there were other spiritual forces that were trying to dominate the, the universe through the, through the auspices of Lucifer. You shall have no other gods before me. This only makes sense in the context of love. It only makes sense to obey God's commands and to appreciate those commitments if you really love Him. No matter how much you make verbal uh, uh, commitments to a business relationship or a friend relationship or to a marital relationship, especially in intimacy of marriage, if there's no love there, does it really work? It doesn't work. This is a God's statement towards the universal challenge that Satan had been bringing upon the universe from the time of his fall. This was the problem in heaven and in Eden, and it will be the problem in the last days. The tendency to worship things other than God, or to make, to be more specific, to make ourselves God in place of God. What was it that, that, that Lucifer did when he rebelled? He says, I shall ascend into the clouds. I shall climb the mount. I shall make myself like the Most High. In Ezekiel 28, he says, you declare yourself that you are a God. What did Satan say to Eve? If you eat this fruit, then you shall be like who? You can be like God. You won't need God. You'll be God. You'll be above God. You won't need him at all. You can be God. What does the man of sin do in 2 Thessalonians in the last days? It says he sets himself up in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. The first commandment is God's message to all of the universe. That doesn't work. The only thing that works is a committed relationship that I have already shown my commitment to you. I've already saved you. I've already loved you. I loved your fathers before you. I will love you forever. I will never give up on you. All I'm asking is that you make the same commitment to me. Will you forsake all others? and make me your Lord and Savior. It is an invitation to an intimate and exclusive relationship. Again, many, I hear people read this and say, what, you know, God, he just seems so, so, you know, he seems so demanding. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get to choose. I don't get to have any say in this. I just have to accept you as, and, and, and that's it. No, you can reject him. You can reject him. But he will never reject you. He will never reject you. And he invites you into a loving relationship of commitment. And all other law, all other parts of God's law and, and, and outreach springs from this first commitment. If you cannot commit to making God your first and supreme authority and influence in your life, none of the other laws make sense. None of the other commands make sense. If he's, if he's not your first commitment, who cares if you take his name in vain? If he's not your first commitment, who cares if you violate his Sabbath? If he's, not, if he's not your first commitment, who cares what he says about stealing and adultery and theft? You, you've not committed to him. You have other commitments that you've made. And you've allowed those commitments to be the more dominant influence in your life. But God says, if you want to experience true freedom and salvation, commit to me as I have committed to you. Make me first in your life. That's my first command. 
And I, I want to share with you, when you really dwell on this and grasp it, I, I want you to understand, it, it touches upon and it impacts almost every element of our life. And many of the very issues that we're struggling with in society today, if Christians embraced the very first word of God, the very first command of the Lord to make him first in your life, when we develop, when we get into questions about when does life begin, we would first ask, well, what does God say on it? Not what this political organization says, not what this person says, what does God say about life? When we ask the question, well, can someone have a different biological gender than a psychological gender? We say, well, what does God say about that? I have made a commitment to God first. And before I draw my conclusion, when we talk about so many of the issues of life, if we make this commitment first, we begin to understand that first we have to ask, well, what does God say on this? But we've fallen so easily into the trap of saying, no, I'm God. I know best in this. I don't really need to know. He has his side. I have my side. And I'm going to make my own decision. Doesn't mean that these aren't easy uh, or, or that these are easy uh, social issues or questions. There are dynamics and circumstances and, and questions that can be quite, quite challenging. But if we begin with that first commitment, first and foremost, I am committed to God. And I will let him be the first voice and the first word before I consult any other. It would greatly improve our ability to move forward in our relationship with God and in bringing people closer to Jesus Christ. I hope that that makes sense and I hope I've not stepped on any toes and I'll let you work it out in your own heart when it comes to that. Have you made a commitment to the Lord? You know, I think this is one of the greatest challenges of our generation, this whole idea of commitment. Have you really committed to God as your first and only Savior? Have you noticed that He has already provided everything necessary for your happiness and your success and your salvation? He's already committed to you. He's already died on the cross. He's already in heaven preparing a place for you. He's already providing His promise to you right now. Have you committed to him? What is stopping you? What is preventing you from being baptized? What is stopping you from getting more engaged with the work of God? Let's pray. Father, we live in very unique times, and there are still many questions that we have, and and, and we don't always have the clarity and the answers that we wish we had. But Lord, even thousands of years ago, you provided a pathway of understanding how much you love us, how much you're committed to us. And when you gave the law, when you gave the Ten Commandments, it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, uh, rules to prevent us from stubbing our toes or from, from making decisions that, that we wanted to make on our own. You were expressing your love Towards us. You were expressing your commitment towards us, and you were giving us the opportunity to respond to you with the same level of commitment. You were trying to show the universe that love still is the best policy, that no matter what Satan does, no matter what those who have fallen into sin and embraced sin, no matter what they say or do, that love and intimacy and commitment are still the greatest force and power in the universe. So Lord, help us to make you first in our lives, first in our decisions, first in our homes and our families, first in how we order and line our lives. Thank you, Father, that we can be in your service and in your family. Thank you that you have already proven yourself over and over and over. Don't let anything hold us back from making the same commitment to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Lord bless you on this Sabbath day. Potluck is in the building next door if you can stay. Um, other than that, God bless you, and we hope to see you next Sabbath. Lord bless.